It's my pleasure to introduce you to our keynote speaker this morning, Mr. Michael Levin. Michael is the president of Customs Solutions, Inc. Uh, he's worked with many Fortune 500 companies, including Pepsi-Cola and Oracle. And he's also a three-time number one best-selling author with his latest book entitled Let Them See You Sweat, Lessons I've Learned on My Journey with Stress. So Michael's keynote today is titled Taking Ownership of Your Life's Journey. And I'm looking forward to hearing his insights on leadership, stress management, and really building emotionally intelligent businesses. I'm sure the themes of grit and resilience will come up in Michael's speech, and that's certainly something that we look to instill in all of our learners at Taylor's schools. So without any further ado, please join me in welcoming Michael to the stage. Thank you, Angelina. Good morning. Good morning. So we've got a few awake people after what I understand were some pretty robust activities last night. From that picture, you can probably tell, since my name is there, that's me in the lower right, proof that at one point in time I actually did have hair. My sister next to me, my mother and father. My talk this morning on owning your life's journey was a talk I was candidly a bit reticent to give. It was not my idea, it was my team's. Because they knew my background, they knew my history, and I said to them, I really don't want to have a talk about what I've overcome. Because so many have had to overcome way more than I ever have. And they said, this is not about what you've overcome. It's about what you've learned and to share those lessons. And I thought, okay, that's kind of cool. I'd like to do that. And so today my talk is going to be about those lessons. Let me give you a little bit of background as to why they felt this talk could work, and I will share more later on. I lost my mother to cancer when I was 16 years old, and my father by suicide when I was 18 years old. At that point in time, I was taking a gap year from high school and I started a teenage discotheque. And all of my money went into that teenage discotheque. My sister was an exchange student over in Belgium. And my nearest family was 2,000 miles away. What I found was my life was changing. I was now alone. And also broke because my father had no money either. He had invested in a startup business of his. It didn't make it. And what I had left behind from him was a note and a check that was going to pay the bills for about a month. And then I needed to figure out where I was going. I lived in California at the time, and I wanted to stay. So I needed to figure out where my journey was going to take me. And I'll tell you more about that a little later on. But first of all, I have a question for you. Let's see how awake you are after last night. You see two tigers in that picture. Can you find the hidden tiger? If you can find the hidden tiger, please raise your hand. Well, we've got one up front. I'll give you a few more seconds to see if you can find the hidden tiger. Where's the hidden tiger? Very nice. It is written in the stripes. Exactly. The reason I'm sharing this with you is because I did what most people would do on this. I looked at the trees behind the tiger. I looked at the brush under the tiger. I looked at the thicket to the right of the tiger. And what am I looking for? A tiger, not the words. We aren't looking for the words that are right in front of us. Because so often, we're looking all around and those answers, those solutions that we are searching all over for and can't find are in front of us. In my talk today, really in all my talks, in all my sessions, nothing's complicated. But a lot of times it's counterintuitive. It's not what comes to us naturally, and it's easy for us to miss things. So let me give you my first lesson. My first lesson may be the harshest, which is I will not be a victim. That no matter what happened, I could look back and say, and this is why it was not going to be about what I've overcome. I had a good foundation. I had good parents. My mom was incredible. My dad was brilliant. 
Not going to win Father of the Year, but he was a brilliant guy. Not the best people skills. But I had been set up, and I knew that I had a solid foundation to build off of. And I knew I was going to find a way to succeed. I was going to find a way to get past all this. Because it can be our natural tendency to slide into this role. By a show of hands, how many of you are familiar with the hero, victim, villain triangle? You may have seen this. Good. More hands than I expected. Because it's very easy for us to fall into this triangle and create drama where none needs to exist. And why do we do it? When we think about the movies that we enjoy, especially if they're action or drama, there's always going to be a hero. The bigger the hero, the better. Always got to be a villain. The bigger the villain, the better. And there has to be victims. The more victims, the better. That's what we want to see. Even in comedies and so forth, there's got to be something going on. And we create that in our own lives as well. And it's natural for us to do. It's a place we can inherently go. The reason for that is we have between 60 and 90,000 thoughts a day, and between 70 and 80% of those are negative. It's just where our mind goes. Plus, the other thing, too, is it can be more fun. It's more fun to gossip. It's more fun to talk about things and create drama where none actually needs to exist. My wife and I recently moved to Southern California, lived in Northern California before in a cul-de-sac. And when the neighbors would get together, these are all successful people. You know what they didn't talk about? They didn't say, can you tell me all the wonderful things that are going on for the neighbors? They're saying, what's the gossip? My wife had recently moved in. She was my fiance at the time. I was away for a little while, and I think I remember this accurately. I came back, and the guest bedroom had been completely redone. And I don't know how she did this. She's in the back of the room now. You'll see her later on. She's going to go hide because she's 5'2 and petite. And somehow she managed to move these two huge bookcases that were bolted to the wall because we were right next to an earthquake fault. And I think she did it by herself. So when I came back, it had been completely redone. And the gossip in the neighborhood was, because I had no idea she was doing this, What's Mike going to think? I thought, this is great. She's making my house ours. And when I found out what the gossip was, I said to my neighbors, really? That's the best you got? The best you got is what my wife did to our spare bedroom? It is where we go. And it's just a natural tendency. I was working with a client and teaching my leadership workshop series. What I ask the participants to do is to put into practice something they learned. And with this company, a smaller company, working with their satellite facility, they had a refrigerator in that small site. It was like a college dorm room refrigerator. It was really small. Their goal, because this workshop was about communication, was to influence their president to get them a larger refrigerator. There was no drama necessary. I knew in advance the president would do it for them. She just wanted them to do the research, do the homework, see if there was a used one available, and she would get it. Instead, what happened was the general manager of that site said, she will never buy us a refrigerator. I'm going to get us that refrigerator, and I will pay for it myself. So he became the hero. He made her the villain. And he made all of his employees victims. Now, the funny thing was, I was opening that next workshop with this concept. I found out what he did. We sat down before the workshop, and he said, I really screwed up, didn't I? I said, yes, you did. <laughs> and he took ownership for it. His penance was he ended up buying the refrigerator. He had to pay for that refrigerator out of his pocket. But it is our natural tendency. It's what we do. And our goal is to stay out of the drama and stay away from this triangle. My next lesson for you is we create our own reality. I personally believe this to be true, and sometimes I've been good about it, sometimes not so much. When I look back, my personal dream was to be a professional baseball player. And while I never played professional baseball, I did make it to the semi-pro level. When I look back, I can honestly say I did everything I could. 
I gave it my best shot. I have no regrets. And I made it to a higher level than most. That was my reality. But when I look at college and what I did, I took more of a prescribed path. Then I thought, I just need to go get a good job. I got a marketing degree, got a job in sales, didn't really like it. But if I thought about my passion, it was sports. I would have gotten a degree in sports broadcasting, sports journalism, sports management, something different if I'd really thought about what I love doing. When I did start to follow it again was I've always been entrepreneurial. Before, even before that disco, I had a newspaper out when I was nine years old. I wanted to own my own businesses. So I'd started businesses while running divisions for Pepsi. And there came a time, I was running San Francisco and Oakland at that time, when Pepsi reorganized. And I had to have a choice at that stage. Because my job was going away. I knew I was not going to be in as high of a position as I was because at that point in time, I was good at what I did, but I was really bad politically. And me and my boss were not best friends. So when that time came, I had to make a choice. Am I going on with my career? Or am I following the prescribed path? Or am I going to follow more of my entrepreneurial desires? And I made the choice at that time that my corporate career was over. And I was going to follow my path. I was going to follow my path to be an entrepreneur. And I stayed at Pepsi for a while longer in a lower position until I got my business off the ground. I also consulted for Pepsi after I left in training and safety. And about a year into my consulting engagement with them, the, B the VP of safety got promoted back to headquarters. And she and I were close. She said to me, would you like my job? And I said, no, I'm good. And she said to me, don't you want the security? And I said, I'll create my own. And I've much preferred that journey. I want to tell you a little bit about Tina, someone who was in one of my workshops. This also happened to be a satellite facility of another company. And what they did was they put all of their supervisors, all of their managers, all of their leads, and all of their front office staff through my workshops. Tina was new. She was in an administrative role, had been there three months. And she was waiting on a job description. She had been floating. She didn't know what she was doing, and she was getting frustrated. She was doing what you would typically do, waiting on senior leadership to tell her what her reality was, what her job was going to be. In that workshop, I asked Tina, I said, you've been here three months. You've had a chance to get a good feel for this organization. You know where your skill set lies. You know what motivates you. What's stopping you from writing your own job description? And the general manager said, that would be great. I would love it if you would, which she did. And then Tina realized, I don't have to wait on others to tell me what my reality is. I can create my own. From there, Tina decided, I want to learn purchasing. She got a job in the purchasing department. She did well at that, became their purchasing manager. She topped out there and said, I've run some projects here before. I'd like to become a project manager. And so she found a company, despite not having the background, to be a project manager. And she has continued to grow. And every once in a while, she stays in touch. And she will always continue to drive and lead her own reality. I also want to keep this real, too. Ed was kind enough to book me for an earlier workshop with the business managers. And we talked about change. What I really enjoy in those workshops is a chance to get to know you, get to know what your lives are like, got to have lunch. And I also know that when it comes to creating your own reality, for your students to create their reality, there can be cultural norms and pressures, familiar norms and pressures, things that can get in the way or challenges for students not to follow a prescribed path. And I totally understand that. And if you were to ask me, what's the solution under those circumstances, what I can tell you is, I don't necessarily have it. I do have one hint for you later. But the solution comes from all of you. Because for those of you in my change workshop, you know that I believe those closest to a situation know best how to impact things. And for those of you who are in situations where it's challenging for your students to create their own reality, the people in this room, 
I know have some great solutions to be able to help them. And by the way, and this is a shameless plug, if you want to come join me in the Q&A session, we can discuss that further. And if you want a methodology for how to do it, come to my 2, uh, two o'clock team building session in the garden gallery. I read last night I got moved to the garden gallery. I don't know where I was before that, but this is at least what I think, because I'm creating my own reality here, is that the business manager said, that guy was so good, we're going to move him out of a country, and we're moving him to the garden gallery. <laughs> that sounds cool, doesn't it? I haven't seen that room. It may be no different than the other rooms. That sounds kind of cool. I want to be in the garden gallery. So come join me in the garden gallery at 2 o'clock. Next one up. is pay it forward. And I understand paying it forward is something that you can relate to. And this is where I'll tell you more of my journey. When I was trying to figure out what I was going to do, and I knew that my disco I had needed to go away, it was not paying the bills, I was going to go to college, I was going to find a way to make enough money, and I was certainly trying to go through a grieving process as well. I was extremely close to my mom, not nearly as close to my father, but for those of you who have been touched by it, you know losing someone by suicide is definitely different than losing someone through most other causes. And so I was trying to get through that at the same time and then figure out, where am I going? Where am I going to live? Where's my life going to take me? And I need to figure that out. And then a little miracle came into my life. I was having dinner with a friend of my sister's. I did not know her well, only knew her family in passing, and I told her about what was going on. The next night when I'm at the disco, I get a phone call, and it's from her mom. Her name's Shirley Rice. And Shirley said, after work tonight, why don't you come over here and spend the night here, and let's just see what happens. I remember Shirley's reaction when I showed up at her door because we had really never met. Her first reaction was, I had no idea you were so tall. Shirley was about 5'2". That one night turned into four years, and I lived with her throughout college. I turned out to be the first of many people she took in, including my sister and several others. She had a lot of adopted kids. What made this an interesting dynamic is I am Jewish by heritage. I'm not that religious. And she was a devout, born-again Christian. And she had tried to, in many cases, try and influence me to convert. And we had great conversations about it. Out of respect to her, I would go on Easter and Christmas to church with her, played on their church softball team. And they were a great community. They helped me move into her house. Shirley passed away the week before we got married. And so I ended up giving the toast at our wedding and that next week the opening eulogy at her funeral. And what I said was, Shirley may not have been able to save me in the way she wanted to, but she saved me in so many other ways. And for Shirley, this was about paying it forward. And not paying it forward without the thought of what she was going to get out of it. Because what I know, what I know for sure, she didn't pay it forward. She didn't bring me in as her path into heaven. She already knew she was going there. That was her belief. It was because it was the right thing to do. But taking me and taking the others in, helping us build our lives was the right thing to do. And she gave me that life lesson of paying it forward and paying it forward without the thought of what is in it for you. My next one is to make a commitment. Make a commitment to what you want. Make a commitment to what is important for you. I used to speak before entrepreneur groups, and people would come up to me and say, I've got this idea, what do you think? And I'd say, I honestly have no idea. I've had ideas that I thought would be great that didn't make it, and I've had products that did. Some that were a bit surprising. So I didn't know. But what I saw from so many of them is they didn't make that full commitment to get their product to market. They would get to a certain place and they would quit. 
they wouldn't make that full commitment to do what they needed to do. And one of the best things to do is to talk about it. Get your idea out there. Make people aware of what your commitments are. And then to make sure you put your plan together. One of those things for me was this novel little product that I have a patent on, a bandage for split fingernails. I started this back in my Pepsi days. The patent attorney that we had, one of the best things he did for us was two pieces of advice. It wasn't about getting the patent. Because we wanted to take the shortcuts. We wanted to do it the easy way. We wanted to do what many people do, which is get this patented for us, we're going to go sell the rights, and we're going to sit back and collect royalty checks. Good luck with that one. That doesn't work very well. He quoted us the line out of the movie Field of Dreams, if you build it, they shall come. And that's what we did. We made our product. So we sold it directly. We did license it to other companies like Avon and Sally Hansen. And I finally left Pepsi when this novel little product was making me more than I was as a senior executive. But he told us as well that if you have an idea, if it's a good one, at least 50 others have that same idea. Are you going to be the one that breaks through? Are you going to be the one that actually gets it to market? And with that, I'd like to share something with you, something I've not shared in any other talks, because it's a commitment of mine that I would like to make going forward and have set some things in motion. But it's so easy when we have ideas, when we have dreams, that we don't take them as far as they should. In fact, let me ask you a question first, because I can raise my hand on this one too. How many of you have ever had an idea for a product and at some point in time you never did anything about it, but you saw your idea on a store shelf or on an online site? Raise your hand if you've had that experience. Yeah, there's a number of hands going up on this one. It's easy to do. We can dream about things but not follow through on them. So let me give you one of mine. And I'll tell you where we put this in motion. One of my businesses is a real estate investment business. And I've got homes in everything from nice areas to more challenging areas. One of the more challenging areas is Detroit, Michigan. I was with my property manager one day. We were visiting my houses. We stopped by another house, not one of mine, but he needed to collect some rent from them. It was a young couple, really nice young couple, challenged financially. In fact, my property manager had given them some work to do as well to try and help them earn some extra income. They have these two beautiful young girls. So while he's in there with them, I'm playing with the girls, holding them. And I realized these two girls, talk about having to overcome, for them to break out, for them to get out of this neighborhood if that was their choice, to get a college education was going to be extremely difficult for them. They were not going to have it nearly as easy as I did. And what hit me is, my wife and I don't have any kids. We have a toy poodle, that's it. Our family members, they're fine. They're going to be just fine. They don't need our financial support when we aren't around. So I want to create a legacy. And what we've established, and it's in our estate plan now, is a scholarship fund for the inner city youth of Detroit. And I want to get this fund established. My goal is to have it up and going in the next two years. I don't know if I'll get this off the ground, but that is my goal. I want to make that happen. And our estate will also continue to seed that fund, and I'd like to get funding from others. So in sharing this with you, the more people you tell about, the more real it becomes, the more you have made that commitment. And I'm also sharing with you for another reason, because you know far more, more about this than me. My next plan is, when I'm in Michigan next year, to see if the superintendent of schools there well, talk with me. Well, give me an audience. Let me pass my idea by and see if I can get a plan together as to how this can be executed. And if you have ideas for me, because you are far closer to this type of thing than I am, I would love to have your ideas, and I'll show you how you can reach out to me at the end of my talk. And if you do, if you have thoughts, if you have ideas for me, I would love to get them. And I would love your help in helping me honor and make that commitment as well. Next up is patience and perseverance. This actually came from my sister's mother-in-law because that bandage that I showed you 
I thought it would take me about two years to get off the ground. It was actually about five years. It took much longer than I expected. Now, I'm total type A, total driver, so the perseverance part wasn't that hard. The patience part was really hard. Because in anything that's worthwhile, any path you know, you've got ups and downs. There is no linear path. It's not that natural path upwards. It's up and down. And a good day may be one in which there was just one step forward and one step back. Breaking even was good. Two steps forward, one step back, not a bad day. Some days, way down and needed to recover. And it took a long time. But that patience and perseverance, if this is something you really want, if this is something that's important to you, to stick with it, to stay with it and see it through. I can tell you where I've had the tougher side is and when I have an idea and believe in it, is the timing to give it up. That can actually be my bigger challenge. But as long as you've got something that you think is worthwhile, to stay with it. The next step for me is to establish your vision and goals. And what I mean by your vision is to take a look at where are you at today and where do you want to be tomorrow. To be able to convey that in a sentence or two so that way anyone else impacted by your vision can be on the same page. That can have it be simple. Can have it be like lion stripes right in front of you. Excuse me, the tiger stripes right in front of you. You want to have that vision be crystal clear. Now, it can be fluid. It can certainly change because a lot of times we may find with our vision we might have been a little too grandiose, may have been bigger than what we should have taken on, and sometimes it has legs. Sometimes it becomes much bigger than we ever anticipate, and that vision can change and grow. But that vision should be what it looks, feels, sounds, tastes like, and to have it be as vivid as possible and to ensure we are all on the same page. I want to make sure that there's a distinction between that and a mission statement. Because candidly, I'm not a big believer on mission statements. I think the mission statement is the plaque on the wall, something you see on a website. And the reason for that is because it's not your words. It's your behavior. It's your culture that creates it. That that mission statement is what you live, not the words behind it. And ideally, if you have those words, it matches. With one client I was working with, when you walk through your, their lobby, they had these five huge banners hanging from the ceiling. On each banner was one word. Those words reflected their mission statement. When you came in, every single day you had to walk through that lobby and you had to see those five words. I had 15 people in my leadership workshops. They had all been there for years, walked through that lobby every single day. I asked them, what are the five words on the banners in your lobby? Guess how many knew what they were? Zero. <laughs> Not one. That's how much that matters. It just doesn't. In fact, with one other client, 3D printing client, I'm doing my workshop, and when you go in, up their steps, instead of banners, they had one word on each step, reflecting their mission as a company, who their culture was supposed to be. When I take breaks, I'll ask senior leaders, how do you like how the workshop's going? Any changes? And this president, it was the first time I've had someone this upset with me. He said, we've been talking for an hour, and you have not brought up accountability once. You have not addressed accountability. And there was a message for me when he told me that. Because what that meant to me was, the problem wasn't with his people and accountability. The problem was with him. That he wasn't holding himself accountable. And sure enough, that came up in flying colors. We saw it time and time again. And so those words on the steps really didn't matter. Because unless he lived it, unless he breathed it, unless his behavior reflected those words on the steps, that wasn't their culture anyway. So focus much more on your vision than you do on your mission statement. And focus on your behaviors to create the culture you want. How many of you are familiar with SMART goal setting? Good, a lot of hands. Okay. 
just a quick rundown for setting goals because I know this has been around since forever. And if goals have these five qualities, they have a tendency to stick. Mine are a little different than the norm, the S being specific, M measurable, A action oriented, you will see attainable on most models, R realistic, you might see relevant, and the T being time bound. Let me just walk through this very quickly for today's purposes because if it does have these five qualities, your, sh your chances of completing them really do increase significantly. An easy example is an exercise program because we've probably all done it. We've probably started one, we've quit them, done it many times. So specific would be, for example, I'm working out on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 7 a.m. And on Monday, I'm going to the gym. On Wednesday, I'm going to Pilates. On Friday, I'm going to yoga. My measurables, I want to gain 20 pounds. I want to lose 20 pounds. I want to run a marathon. The action-oriented is I'm actually doing something about it. In the U.S., when it comes to, let's say your goal was to lose weight, what is the billion-dollar industry around weight loss? Taking a pill. There's one I've seen recently for gummies. They show the before picture. This person takes a gummy and they're slender. Well, that is great. I don't have to work out. I don't have to go to the gym. I don't have to diet. I can just chew a gummy. I'm in. Sign me up for that one. Probably not action-oriented enough. Probably need to do a little more. Realistic. The realistic piece, if you say I'm going to work out seven days a week, four hours a day, probably not realistic. Make it something you can accomplish. And maybe the most important in many respects is time bound. It should appear on a calendar and a watch, not as soon as possible. And to make sure that when you're being time bound, if others are impacted, if you need others to accomplish something, you're on the same page. And everyone knows when things need to be done by. Next one for you. We're going to have a little fun with this one. Is to celebrate the wins. Because our natural tendency, our natural tendency is to focus on what's wrong. Goes back to the 60 to 90,000 thoughts. And I can be just as guilty of this. With my real estate business, I talk to my property managers once a month. They send me reports. And my focus is what we would typically do. I'm not taking a look at what's been collected. I'm not taking a look at the good stuff. I'm taking a look at who didn't pay the rent. What big expenses came up that I didn't expect? And that's what I'm talking with them about. And I realize, if you've ever been a property manager, it's tough. It's hard work. And I needed to celebrate their wins with them. I talked to one of my property managers about this, and I said, I want to make sure we start celebrating the wins. Talk about the things you're proud of, the accomplishments you had, the things I'm not going to know. He was so excited, I had an email back in 20 minutes with this whole list of things about every property and all the things he was proud of accomplishing. And he was so excited we were adding this to what we do. When I had done this well, for example, I had a health and wellness business, and I ran the sales side, and my partner ran the operations side. Is each week in our meetings, I would ask the salespeople, share something you are proud of. Share something you are proud of that I'm not going to know about. A customer that complimented you. A new product you got in somewhere you've been trying to do for a long period of time. But share what you're proud of. On a quarterly basis, we would go out. And we would celebrate. We'd celebrate the wins. We'd go have cocktails, enough to be more open but not inebriated. And have some appetizers. And hang out together and make sure we celebrated those wins. So what I'm going to ask you to do for just a moment is could I have everybody stand up? Okay, now we're doing jumping jacks. I'm just kidding. Don't do jumping jacks, please. I'd like you to think about this past year for you and the things that you've accomplished and the wins that you have had, the wins that you are proud of whether it's personal wins, wins for the people you're, you support, wins for your students. And what I'd like you to do, because you've all learned it, we don't do this enough, 
Would you give yourself a standing ovation for what you've done? We need to get more applause. We don't get enough applause. We don't get enough applause for ourselves. And while you're still standing, can we do this too? I get the honor and pleasure of doing this, of being in front of you. And when we sold our health and wellness business to a private equity firm, my partner asked me, am I going to retire? And I was doing consulting, doing talks like this, and I said, I kind of am, because this is fun. This isn't work. This is great. I love doing this. It is such a pleasure to do this. And I'll get asked, when you're in front of a group of this size, do you get nervous? Hell yes. <laughs> of course you do. If I stop feeling nerves, I can't do this anymore because it means that I have lost that desire to do what I can possibly do to deliver the most that I can. But what makes me the most nervous isn't standing up here. It's all the logistics. It's all the things that can go wrong from the AV side of things to the coordination of getting here to making sure that I'm fully prepared to be in front of you. What I can tell you is this Earcoast team, Ed has been my contact for the last four years, has been absolutely exceptional. I think they have done an amazing job. And this conference is so well organized. It is so well put together. The support is absolutely outstanding. And I'd like to ask you if we could applaud for them as well and all the hard work that this team has done. Okay, you can sit down now. Thank you very much for doing that with me. I appreciate that. But I would encourage you to celebrate the wins. And I said, going back to the cultural and familial challenges, that this is just an idea I have. You are going to have the solutions that I don't. But if they have a prescribed path, and let's say as you get, you're getting to know your students, you know their passions, things that may not go down that prescribed path, something that may be different, it may just be a word of encouragement from you. It may just be you recognizing them that may not happen outside of your classroom. To let them know what you think, how proud of them you are, because they may not get that elsewhere. Let me see if I can do this without screwing this up. I'm going back to the first slide. Anyone know how to do that? Slide number, press enter. That way you don't have to click all the slides. When I looked at this picture, our family did not take pictures. This is literally, I believe, one of two family pictures that I have. That's it. You can see how warm and fuzzy we are with all of our arms by our side. But one thing that stood out to me in this picture, and I may be imagining this too, this could be like the garden room when I go down and see it, is I noticed my dad looking at me and the look that he gave me. And what I can tell you, at least by my memory, is I don't ever remember my dad saying, I'm proud of you. But that look to me, without me knowing it during this picture, to me said that he was. And I may be imagining it, but I'm going to take that. And even though I am now 15 years older than my dad was when he passed, I'll still take that. So you as students, you with your students, can help them celebrate their wins. It may just be awarded to something that in passing doesn't necessarily mean that much to you. But it may mean a ton to them. Next up is the network. Have any of you read any of the Richard Carlson Don't Sweat the Small Stuff books? Anyone? Fewer hands on this one. They're pretty cool, very easy read. In one of his books, he said, network before you need the relationship. Really important words. I would add to that, Network selflessly. Network without thinking about what's in it for you. When I was with Pepsi, I was getting promoted every year, so I always had a whole new group of people to meet. One of the first things I would do was get in touch with all my cross-functional counterparts and ask them, what can I do to support you? What can I do to make your life easier? 
And typically, you know what would happen. They'd say the same thing back to me. I had just taken over San Francisco and Oakland for Pepsi, and I was making the rounds with my people, getting a chance to get to know them, asking the usual questions. What's going well? What challenges are you facing? I was in front of the Oakland route drivers, and I was, I think, 30 years old at the time. Most of my team was older than me, many significantly older. One of the route drivers said something to me that definitely stood out. He said, listen, we were here long before you got here. We're going to be here long after you leave. Just don't screw it up while you're here. <laughs> Except to use the four-letter word a little more crass and screw. I had a laugh. I said, I get it. I understand exactly where you're coming from. And I'd like you to still tell me about the challenges you're facing. He said to me, as a satellite facility of San Francisco, we get our paychecks one day later than they do. Do you think we can get them at the same time? And I said, I don't know. Let me find out. I'd already networked with my accounting contact. We'd had that conversation. And I asked him, what's the possibility of the Oakland people getting their paychecks at the same time? He said, no problem. I'll make the change. Six months later, I'm sitting down with the same group. That same route driver said to me, I want to thank you. You're the first person to come in here and actually do what they said they were going to do. The only thing I did for that person in six months directly was get him his paycheck one day earlier. Something that we may do is a great lesson for me that means nothing to us or very little to us can mean so much to somebody else. And by networking, by making connections, it can be so much easier to facilitate helping others because that little thing you do may make a big difference in somebody else's life. My next lesson up is to be flexible because so often we can get stuck. We can get stuck with our own thoughts, with our own ideas. In fact, I love that this question came up it came up in the group I had earlier, the business managers, when we talked about change. Someone asked the question, because when it comes to change, I believe what you are doing, and I believe in creating entrepreneurism. I'm not a big believer in top-down. That all those impacted are the ones that get to facilitate and lead and drive that change. The question that I was asked was, well, what if the leader's idea, the leader's direction, that other people want to do it differently than them? And I told them I'm glad they asked because you need to let that go. You need to be willing to relinquish control, to be flexible, to allow others to lead, to allow others to have their ideas, to implement them, to give them the chance to succeed, the chance to fail, the chance to learn and grow from making those changes, but to be flexible and to be willing to relinquish control because control really is an illusion. It is. I can tell you that personally. We've got a seven-pound toy poodle. When we got this toy poodle, we thought, we're going to train this toy poodle. That toy poodle has trained us. That toy poodle goes to the bathroom in the right place. It will sit for a treat. In fact, what it does, it's trained us because it walks into the, into the kitchen when we're there, and it sits down saying, where's my treat? I'm sitting. We can't even control our dog. You certainly aren't going to be able to control your teams. It really is an illusion. And relinquishing that control actually gives you more control because you don't have to fight it. You give them the chance to learn, the chance to grow, to be flexible for different things. For me personally, one of those things that came up I had lived in Danville, California for 30 years. And my wife and I recently moved to our beach town community in San Clemente, California, about 400 miles south. We'd been looking for a few years. And we were going to be patient. We wanted to find the right house. After we moved, what I was so surprised to hear was so many close friends, friends who had known me forever, said, I can't believe you moved. They thought there was no chance I would ever leave Northern California. I was locked in there, that I wasn't going to be flexible enough to start a brand new life at this stage. And I always knew all along, I was done. This next third of my life was going to be someplace different. 
And my wife even gave me the out. She said, we can remodel your house. And no, no, we're starting a new life. To be flexible for that. And even six months in, we are very grateful that we've made that change. But to be open and flexible to new things, new experiences. And my last lesson for you today. Oops, let's go back one. Oh, sorry, we're going away. Vulnerability is a strength. How many of you have read the book, The Five Dysfunctions of a Team? A lot of hands on that one. I had always said that I felt vulnerability was a strength. And in that book, that is one of the things that they talk about. That vulnerability is important as a leader. That you have to be willing to be vulnerable. Because unless you are fallible as a leader and can own up to your mistakes, your people never will be. Your students won't be. They will feel per that perfection is the only option. But if we're going to grow, if we're going to be innovative, if we're going to be entrepreneurial, there have to be successes and there have to be failures by definition. If you go to my website, it talks about the multi-million dollar businesses that I have launched and grown. It doesn't talk about the businesses that just did eh, or the some that just didn't make it at all. Because that's part of the journey. So you've got to allow for that. You've got to allow for that vulnerability. I'm going to share a story that I shared on uh, Thursday that I grew up in Colorado and never went skiing. The reason for that was, at least the reason that I said, was I played sports and the coaches did not want you to go skiing and get hurt. My real reason, though, was it seemed to me when someone went skiing, when they fell down, they broke an arm, they broke a leg, they ended up in a cast, and I didn't want to end up in a cast. Finally, in my 20s, I went skiing for the first time. Best thing that happened to me that day was I fell down. And guess what? No broken arm, no broken leg. I got to get up and learn from it. That falling down wasn't a performance issue, it was a learning experience. And we need to help our people, our students, become comfortable with the fact that falling down is okay. It's getting back up that's important. It's learning from it, and how are we going to grow from it? That if you're willing to be vulnerable, that's when you can really help your team. I told you I want to give you a way to get in touch with me as well, too. Oh, before that, I've got one other slide. That's Joanna. She's hiding in the back taking pictures. And our toy poodle, Riley. Because in terms of being flexible, in terms of being open to change, in terms of being open to growing, I got married for the first time at the tender young age of 58. Same thing like moving to Southern California. My friend said, you're never going to get married. I always thought I would. I just didn't expect it to take so long, but I'm very glad I waited. And if you're open to those changes, those things that can come into your life, that your life journey can be anything. I know I shared as a toast in our wedding that my friends are here for two reasons. First, I'm so fortunate to have the greatest friends in the world. And secondly, if you weren't here to personally witness this, you'd never believe I actually got married. <laughs> but to be open to the good things that can come into your life. Before I share a closing story with you, if you would like slides from today, if you would like e-versions of any of my books, it's all complimentary. Juliana Gadez heads up my marketing for me. If you reach out to her, and please give her a little time, there are a lot of you. She'll be happy to send out e-versions of the slides or any of my books. The book in the far left is my book about collaborative selling. And even if you aren't selling, there are communication tools in there, including my four-step methodology of how you overcome conflicts and questions that can, you may find very uh, beneficial. It is not even as thick as it looks in the picture. You can read it on your flight home. The second book is my number one bestseller on stress called Let Them See You Sweat, which I appreciate Ed has read. Thank you, Ed. And it's about the lessons I learned going through my own journey about how stress can impact you and how so often it goes undiagnosed and about the shame that can be tied to stress and how to get past that. And the last one was a book I had the honor of co-writing with Jack Canfield and many others called The Road to Success. And in that book, 
I write about my leadership philosophy. So if you'd like any of them, all of them, please reach out to her. She will take care of you. If you have ideas for me on my scholarship fund, if you would just like to connect to talk about anything else, please, you can reach out to her. You are welcome to write me directly as well. Just put in michael at michaeljlevin.com to reach me directly. And I want to give you a closing story on paying it forward because I needed to take advantage of that life lesson that Shirley Rice gave me. A good friend of mine, Ernie Barber, he started as my golf instructor, and I became very close to him and his wife, Rose. I was on the road, and I got a phone call from Ernie, and he said, got some news that's not good. He said, I have a brain tumor, and it's inoperable, and prognosis isn't good. By the time I got home, Ernie was in a care facility and in a coma and no one expected him to wake up. Now, Ernie was a dreamer, and Rose, his wife, was very pragmatic. And Rose had been waiting on Ernie to get a life insurance policy, which he never did, because Ernie was the dreamer. And as well, their medical insurance, it wasn't going to cover everything. They had some big expenses coming up. I asked Rose, what can I do to help you? What can I do to help you through this time? And it's interesting what stands out for people as to what's bothering them. And a lot of times it's a little thing. She said, Ernie bought all these shirts for his students, and they are in the back of his truck. Do you think you can get rid of them for me? And I said, sure. I went to the golf course where he taught, met with their general manager, a guy named Joey Pickavance, great guy. I'd never met him before. And I asked Joey, can we put these shirts in your clubhouse, sell them and try and raise a little money for Ernie. And he said, not a problem. And then something hit me. And you know how I talked about your vision can grow. My vision was just get rid of the shirts. That was Rose's. And I said to Joey, how about running a golf tournament in Ernie's honor to try and raise some money for him? He said, I'll give you the course. He said, in fact, I'll do you one better. I'll give you the banquet room and I will sponsor the lunch after the golf tournament as well. So all of a sudden, I'm running a golf tournament. I have no idea what I'm doing. Not a clue. Never done anything like this before. And now for Rose, what helped was she had gotten into the victim side of things. Ernie didn't do this for me. I'm stuck like this. Now Ernie, well, <laughs> we put Ernie back into the right place because Rose now was taking some ownership of her life. She got to help me with this golf tournament. And another couple was helping out. Once a week, we're meeting in Ernie's room. Ernie's in his coma. We're meeting in his room. We're planning this golf tournament. Our goal was we had 120 slots, $150 a person. If we could raise $18,000, we thought that would be incredible. Well, I guess Ernie heard us planning because Ernie woke up. And all of a sudden, Ernie is joining us on planning his golf tournament. We fill all the slots. A lot of people continue to make contributions above and beyond that. We get all these raffle prizes that we were able to give out as well. And by the time we were done with all the planning, putting all this together, for the day of the golf tournament, I was able to hand Rose a check for over $50,000. And for Ernie, for this golf tournament was going to be the celebration of his life because no one expected him to be there. They called him the miracle man. We thought this was going to be recognizing Ernie of the celebration of his life. And he got to be there for that. I mean, how cool is that? He got to be there for that celebration of his life. He gave to give a speech. He got to get a standing ovation from all these people who absolutely adored him. And all because Rose asked me to get rid of some shirts. So you never know where paying it forward can leave. You never know what may come of it. Of it, You never know how you're going to touch somebody's life with the thing you do and how you can impact somebody else's journey. I hope as many of you as possible will join me for the Q&A session after. 
and join me in that garden gallery and see if there are any plants or anything in there at 2 o'clock for team building. It has been such an honor being here with you today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.